Hey guys, Nick here. Just heads up, there's some mature language in this episode. Wanted to give you a fair warning. All right, let's get to it. Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. I'm Michael. And we have Michael DeTullo back again. Uh, This is part two of the Michael DeTullo podcast episode. And if you haven't listened to part one, check that out. Um, We're picking back up where we left off uh, from Michael's, you know, really awesome career of working at Nike and Jordan and all these brands. And he left Frog and now he's going to work for this company called Sound United. Yeah. So, yeah, Michael, tell me. The, so the, the funny thing about Sound United, or the, the really interesting thing, is that I love this story because mm-hmm. you spoke, you talked about this story at the first Core 77 conference. Right. Yeah, because it was, it was we, I think we had just changed the name to Sound United and launched the new product line. So it was like perfect timing. Okay. Yeah. I just, I just remember sitting there. It was like 2014. I was like an intern <laughs> working in, the, in New York and... I was like, whoa, this is a really interesting story about how you went into this company that didn't know anything about design and really changed it around. But yeah, I want to hear more about that. So, and I mean, I think I've talked um, at other places about how important mentors have been in my life. And certainly in part one, we talked about some of the people like Aaron Szymanski at Evo and John Hoke at Nike who really like mentored me. Uh, and and for me, mentors have always just been a constant source of guidance. I, I'm always check in with these, these people. Um, it just kind of keeps you honest uh, and, and helps navigate some confusing things. But one of my early mentors when I was out of school, I was, I was living in Connecticut, um, and I came home, and I had a uh, message on my answering machine because that's we didn't have cell phones still at that time. And it was a message from this older gentleman named Jerry. And he's like, hey, Michael, I also graduated from RISD, also ID, class of 46 or something like that. Oh, whoa, okay. Yeah. He's like, can I buy a lunch? Give me a call back. It's Jerry. <laughs> and uh, I was like, wow, awesome. I mean, I quite I called him right back. And he took me out to lunch at, like, this little greasy spoon diner. And he turned out he worked for Raymond Lowy. Like, I mean, this guy was, what? like, legit oh, wow. okay. awesome, right? Yeah. And he, he had this... You know, it took me over to his house, this awesome, like, super modernist house, and was making, he was retired, and was making all this kind of, like, Brancusi slash Noguchi-esque sculpture. He's, like, in his 80s, like, <laughs> carving marble with, like, <laughs> drills and stuff. I'm like, super badass dude, right? Right, right. But at one point, he, he, he left Raymond Lowy to go work for one of their clients, and he was the VP of design, and he did everything. He, he renamed the company. He designed the factory floor. He designed the offices. He designed the products. He did everything. Which company was it? Do you um, I don't. It was a vending machine company. Oh, okay. I don't remember the okay. name. It was this company in Connecticut that okay. built everything in Connecticut. And um, I asked him, I'm like, Jerry, how did you know? Like, you're working at Raymond Lowy, like, dream job, right? Like at the time, like frog, of, right at the time. How did you know to go? And he's like, you know, Michael, one day you'll meet a client and they'll know how to make things. They'll know how to make good things. They'll know how to sell those things. And they won't know shit about design. When you find that client, you go work there. You're going to teach them everything. You're going to do everything. And that's going to be like the work you're going to love. And I remember the first time I walked into DEI Holdings. So this was now fast forward 15 years, right? Right, right. First time I walked into DEI Holdings, it was just kind of like very nondescript, you know, office park, just gen- total, super generic. The name of the company is like three letters. And, uh, but, you know, really nice people, super high quality products. And, and they're, they're mainly doing audio. Yeah. Like all speakers. Like hi fi audio okay. stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And like huge product line. Um, I mean, we're talking like, you know, thousand plus SKUs. Right. Uh, and I like it, I like hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, "This is what Jerry told me about. This is the company." 
And and I think that was one of my insights about Nike. Like as much as I loved it there, and the whole thing was like a machine to make good design. Like if to do bad design at Nike, you get to really suck. Oh wow! The okay. whole the whole thing is set right. up to do good stuff. Yeah. Um, I, but I always had this feeling of like, I didn't make it cool. It already was cool. It was cool when I got here, mm-hmm. right? So I'm like the best janitor in the world. It was like, hey kid, <laughs> just here it is. Don't mess it up. Right, right, right. You know, keep the floors clean. And so this this was an opportunity to take something that was not cool, and 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 help it to be relevant. And um, and the the cool thing to me, not to overuse that word, was that. As a designer, I could just tell the truth. The products already were great. Like a pair of Polk speakers will last you 20 years. Yeah, um, they sound awesome. Like they're super high performance and they're expensive, but they're high value for the dollar. Like for they they you know they compare. You shop up, right? Like they compare up to right. much more expensive right. things. Um, and so for me, I was like, all I have to do is tell the truth through design, right? To to um, you know, to develop a visual look for how this thing sounds, right? The Polk sound. Uh, I, you know, I interviewed a lot of the engineers. And the cool thing was a lot of the engineers have been there a long time. One of the pe- people that was uh, in charge with voicing all the Polk products, guy Stu Lumsden, amazing engineer, um, and he's retiring this year. He started the company in 1976, the year I was born. So all I had to do was interview these guys. Because it's a freaking everything they said was solid gold, and so Stu was like, "Hey, Matthew Polk, the founder, his insight was like, when you go to a concert, it sounds like this, but speakers sound like that, and it shouldn't be different." Yeah, <laughs> but pretty simple insight. And I was like, "Okay, but what is the difference?" And he's like, "Well, most speakers, you know, they want to have a studio sound. It's very cold and clinical and precise, mm-hmm. but no human listens to anything. And normal people don't listen to things in studios. They listen to things at concerts right. or in the car or wherever, right? Yeah. And that sound is very warm. It's a little bit rounded off. Uh, it's organic. Um, and I was like, oh my God, like there's a, these, all these words are visual. So you know, I switched the material palette away from black to natural woods, mm-hmm. I, I shifted us like like no right angles. Everything had to have like generous curves and radii. So, um, so no no silver. No, it was you know everything was like kind of champagne finished, like nickel finished metals. Uh, okay, and you're like now it looks like how it sounds. Did the sound? Did the materials affect the sound? Like did the wood affect the sound, no. or is this more <laughs> mainly a aesthetic treatment? Uh, it is. I mean, it's a. Uh, uh, I mean, acoustic are really uh, sorry it's like my brain is filled with like acoustic information so I'm trying to simplify <laughs> it down but i mean you are kind of in a weird way building an instrument right so everything you do does affect the sound so it is a a, a real collaborative work with the engineers um and and one of the things i try to do is change the process the process um when i joined was very disjointed it was you know the engineers would go build a proof of concept and then they would bring it to the designer and be like, I'll oh, put a candy wrapper around this. Mm. And then, then they would go back to engineering, get costed out and made. Right. And I was like, no, that doesn't work that way. First thing we got to do is go actually talk to real people yeah. who use the stuff. Because none of us actually even buy it. Right. So we need to go talk to people that buy it, um, answer some unmet needs with the things that we do really well. Right. Which is make things sound better than they have any right to sound. Right. Right. Um, and then together we will then develop a product plan uh, and then together we will work out what it is and how it's made um and you know we will stop uh doing things in a kind of a waterfall diagram and do things much more in parallel Mm, and because we're doing it in parallel we'll actually go faster and because we're talking to actual real people it'll be more relevant yeah Um, so that was, you know, it's a really big, big, big cultural changes. Okay. Uh, you know, got to redesign the headquarters, rename the company. Um, it's yeah, that's insane that you had that much influence over this company that just was like some speaker maker, and it changed into an entire like well-known brand. I mean, yeah. you have, I know you guys did the new like, the Boom. Yeah, I always thought that was a cool brand. Yeah, that was simple insight. Is that. You know, there wasn't a line. All, all the products we had were very um, audiophile driven. And even though we had, obviously, insights that there was a huge market 
um, that maybe wasn't as concerned with the sound quality. Still, we wanted it to sound better than anything in that class, mm. but they were more concerned with the durability, right? So, like, how does it, you know, fit with me in my day in terms of size, uh, which which is a huge limit on sound, uh, and in terms of price, and in terms of like, I don't know what I'm going to be doing, so I mean, it's going to get wet, or I'm going to drop it. Right. I don't care. And this um, was like more geared toward like active users or yeah. people who are out there like skateboarding, like a college student. Yeah, you like, know, just just like think of like how your typical college student treats anything. Right. Right. <laughs> uh-huh. So I mean, that was kind of the like the, the persona who is actually a female college student, uh, and and then like an active male like post college. And you had some unique speakers for that one. I remember like there was yeah. like a speaker that had a bendy. Like yeah, tail swimmer. It. Yeah, and you could like wrap yes. it around like your bike or yeah. something. And so, so, what I knew kind of politically to make this happen was we needed we needed a, a younger, more fun name anyway to describe it, and it had its own design language system. But also, we needed that different name internally so that the engineers could kind of let go of some of those acoustic parameters and be like, okay, I get it. It's not f- for me. It's for this kid, and. I could still give him something way better than Beats, way better than Bose, right. but maybe not as good as like what Polk and Definitive were doing. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think that's... I love the Sound United story because I, I talk to students occasionally when I see them, and a lot of them want to go work for these you know, big name brands mm-hmm. or go work for like a really awesome company that's doing you know maybe really sustainable work. And you know they're searching for these companies that fit their their dream but what you don't hear about often is turning the company into your dream right and that's what you did and i it's hard to do it i mean it is it does help to come in i had i had a a mandate right so the board hired me and i give a lot of credit to the board for having the insight to be like we don't have this thing that this guy has um so but yeah it helps it helps if you can have in, you, you have to be able to have influence, but right, you also right. have to have the latitude to be able to spread that influence. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, you obviously put in your years and you, you know, worked your way up to that. But I also think that there is still some insight into being able to do that straight out of school. Sure. I When I think about my work at PetMate, you know, I went to work for this pet company. Yeah. Not the, it's definitely not the dream company. Mm-hmm. It's not like a BMW or a frog or whatnot. And, you know, I'm designing litter boxes and cat toys. But, you know, I, I just remember that talk that you gave in that conference. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go work at this pet company. And because I was the first designer there in a long time, I had a lot of influence. I was able to, like, come in there and, like, take these dog toys. And like you said, you know, you're not – there's no – it's not a janitor job. Like, you yeah. actually get to take something that's crappy and make it awesome. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just, that's like one of my favorite stories from you, Michael. And Thanks. it's always stuck with me. I was so. terrified. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I was scared to go to do it because it's a huge risk, right? You're like, oh man, I worked for Nike and I worked for Frog and now I'm going to work for this thing nobody <laughs> knows about that owns these brands that nobody knows about. Um, and so it was, a, it was for sure a risk, but I felt like I had done enough things that I could bounce back from that risk if I, if it was a total failure. Right, right. Um, and... I had friends calling me like, dude, what are you doing? Is everything okay? Like you can't go from Nike to frog to this. Like it goes up, right? It doesn't go down. But I'm one of my other mentors uh, from, from Evo, Aaron Szymanski, who's still the owner of that firm. I remember when I was young out of school, we were doing a lot of work for, for companies that, that weren't the, the shiny object brands. Right. And I was like, you know, Aaron, how come we can't do work for like Phillips or, you know, at the time I was doing a lot of cool stuff or, you know, whoever. And he's like, Michael, they already have good design. We sell good design. But you see, they already have it, so why would they buy it? Yeah, yeah. And so we sell good design to people who don't currently have good design. Right. And I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. He's like, he's like, if you had already had bananas at home, would you go buy more bananas? No, you just eat the bananas you already have. <laughs> so we're selling the bananas to people that don't have them. And uh, it's like super logical, right? But like nobody tells you that at school. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I thought that was a really good insight. And he's like, you know, really what happens is eventually we sell good design to people and either they 
they don't get it. They don't understand what to do with it, or they do understand what to do with it. And they'll do more and more work with us to the point where they're like, we should just in-house this and we'll lose them as a client, but that's uh, okay. Cause we'll have taught them. Yeah. And, and it's just understanding where all of your clients are in that pro that process. So then you're always kind of like bringing in other clients at the right time. And huh. That's you're, an interesting you're way managing that pipeline. Yeah. Um, it's always easier uh, and in in some ways better to do work with existing clients because they already know who you are and right. like it's a, it's a shorter sell but that existing client at some point you might do such a good job and teach them so much that they'll outgrow you that, yeah because if you did a yeah that's weird i haven't thought about it that way yeah doing such a great job that you lose the client hmm. now think of frog with apple right i mean it was the Really, oh, I mean, on, 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 as far as we know, the first million dollar design contract was um, Frog with Apple in, I think, 1982. So, I mean, this is like, that's a lot of money in today's dollars. Right. Um, and eventually, Apple just in house all that stuff, right? Yeah. But they caught the bug from Frog. So, hmm. you know, they did their job. Yeah, that, I would love to, like, get like Hartman or like, you know, I miss Steve, but that would have been, I, w I would love to hear that story about how they work together. Hartman had, has, I got to spend some time with him. He was, re he was retired when I was at Frog, but luckily uh, one of the project managers that sat next to me, uh, Jeanette, she was his next door neighbor. And she was like, Hartman, this is young creative director who is like the biggest design nerd you'll ever meet. You got to come in and meet him. And we just would like go to lunch and like, I'd like, tell me all the stories, all of them. I need all the stories. <laughs> and I just, he would just tell me stories of like how he would just get work. You know, he would go, we was doing stuff for Sony, told me the story of like, he just brought one model to the design review. And he was just, he believed in it so much. He just built a full scale model of this giant Trinitron did he not, TV. He didn't say sketch. He didn't bring sketches. Nothing. Or? Just like the one model. He's like, this is it. And no presentation. And you like literally like brought it in, put it on a conference table, and it was like, this is it. Dang. And it like it was like the design that they used for like ten years, like green button, kind of dark gray finish. Wow. And and he's like, then I would just walk around clients' room, clients' uh, buildings, and like snoop around. And they're like, you can't go in here. And he's like, what's this thing? Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, it's this other thing. It's shit. You should have hired us to do it. And he's like, usually it worked. <laughs> There's a trend here I'm, I'm yeah. hearing is that good designers snoop around the office and start I guess picking so. out things to redesign. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely, I learned quickly that one, I loved all every single story I could get from him. Two, I probably would have lasted like two weeks working for him. I mean, really? he was a uh, uh, hard guy. As he would say, like, excellence is our minimum setting. Oh, <laughs> you know, like, okay. I mean, it was just like, but I mean amazing designer you know so now michael you at some point at sign united you decided to leave and start your own thing which is yeah. where you're at currently and i'm really excited to hear about that endeavor and you know i kind of want to pick your brain a little bit more into like your philosophy and your clients mm -hmm. and how you kind of work and you built your own studio now yeah so another terrifying moment right but again like I started to feel really comfortable at Sound United. I, I built a pretty big team. Um, when I started, I was just responsible for industrial design. Every year, I would try to take on a new challenge. So uh, in year, it was just ID in year one. In year two, I took on ID and packaging. In year three, I was like, you know, we could do better print ads than the ad agency. So give me marketing creative. We fired the ad agency. Year four, I brought video in-house, so we were doing all the product launch videos and retail displays and CES booths. So basically to have control of everything from initial conception to like what it said, literally because the copywriters reported to me, what it said on like the tag at Best Buy. Wow. Um, which was cool, but, but I started to feel like, yeah, okay, like how many more speakers am I going to do? Um, and I started to feel a little safe and... I was being really heavily recruited. Um, I was, you know, Tesla was interviewing me. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, a few other companies, um, Dell, was in talking. Anyway, and it, I didn't, those things didn't work out, but I was like, you know, all these companies don't work with me. And I always dreamed of having my own studio. And 
at one point, I had told myself and, and my wife, uh, who has been my constant partner, I mean, we've been together since I've been 19, uh, she's been really my constant partner in this thing, kind of keeping me honest, keeping me on the, the vision. Yeah. Um, I told myself I would do it by the time I was 40. And I was really, I was about to turn 41. And she was like, you know, she knows when I start to get bored. Okay. And it's not good. She's okay. like, you're getting bored. I could tell because you're grumpy all the time. <laughs> you're just getting really crunchy. You told yourself you would do this by the time you're 40. You're almost 41. And, you know, five years ago when I said you should do it, you said, you know, you wanted to build a port a broader portfolio. So you just, you shipped like 30 CE products a year for the last five years to Sound United. You told me you wanted a financial cushion and we built up two years of expenses. You told me you wanted all these things. You got all the things. So it's time to go. Yeah. And so I quit. And I was, ter I mean, I was just like so nervous. It's scary for sure. Yeah. I bet. I mean, you know what it's like. I mean, you I, guys like to be out here. <laughs> I, I would say that, you know, I don't know how how much how scary it was for you i mean you were pretty established but i also think maybe there's another it's kind of like uh a part of the, the the scariness of it is that yeah. because you are established going off your own is maybe a little more risky yeah. like right now i like i got a fat I, mortgage dude right i don't <laughs> i don't do anything i just like i'm yeah. here in my cheap apartment and yeah i don't know so so i um you know i started obviously i didn't just like quit but i i did a bunch of research um, I hired a lawyer, a really good lawyer. I hired a really good accountant. I started filing my LLC paperwork. I'm just like kind of a buttoned up guy. You okay. know, I had like all my contracts drawn up, you know. Um, and, you know, I'm, I used to doing the Saturday work, right? So this was like now my Saturday project. Right. Um, and, and I started interviewing because I just like, I'm not a huge, you know, like design research guy, but I am in a weird way. I'm just kind of a guerrilla research person. So I reached out to all of these kind of small business owners, guys that started their own businesses, who may be doing a few million to, to 15 million in revenue, um, guys that started design firms, people that had small brands. And uh, uh, I just started asking them, like, how did they do it? You yeah. know, what would you mm -hmm. do if you could go back, you know, 20 years? You know, Scott Wilson, I thought Scott Wilson, if you could go back to like day one, what would you tell yourself? Right. You could go back in time. Uh, and it's always amazing how, like, again, you offer someone to buy, you buy someone coffee to talk to you. Yeah. Um, and a few of those people, like, were, were company owners. And of about, like, I probably interviewed about 20 people. And maybe five or six of them asked me to write proposals. So I was like, I don't even have a company yet. I can write proposals. So they're like, no, just write me a proposal. So I started writing proposals um and this is just you proposing to work with the company or they have a project yeah they have a project like i have okay. a project for you write a proposal here's the project here's okay. the brief you write a proposal okay and um and so then i put my notice in because i was like i'm, I'm writing proposals right, now, right. so i need to be <laughs> i need to go <laughs> and uh, and i started building up you know I, I also was interviewing different contractors to do cad work for me and things like that and so by the time I had put in my notice, now we're in contract negotiations for a couple projects. And I started, officially started the studio on, I think it was April 14th. I was a on Monday of 2017. And that day, the first contract signed. Wow. Um, and so on Wednesday, went... the second contract signed. So. so you had zero vacation in between? No, nothing. <laughs> uh, it's just kind of my way. Um, <laughs> Which is, I was happy. Yeah. Uh, and the first project was, in, again, the, the, the purpose, well, I didn't say it before. The purpose behind the studio is, I think you could tell, like, I don't like to be pigeonholed. I don't like to, like, do one thing. Right. That is boring to me. Yeah. I just, and not, not nothing against it if, like, you wanted to, like, design this one thing for your whole life. Awesome. I wish I could be like that. I just can't. I don't have that. And the more different things I design at the same time, the more informed they all become, like the watch band influencing oh, the Nikes, right? right? Right, right, And so they benefit from each other and they yeah. make each other stronger. Uh, and so the purpose of the studio really was to continue that explosion outward, to work on more different things that I had never done before, um, and to get back into the work, right? To be really hands-on and to um, really to have fun. 
So the first project to sign was an architectural project, which I had never done anything in architecture before. But one of the people I interviewed was a real estate developer who I knew. Okay. Uh, and he was a residential real estate developer, and he was branching into commercial. And this was only going to be a second commercial project. And he's like, hey, we just bought this building. It's a piece of shit. Like, redesign the whole building for me inside, outside. Okay. And I'm like, oh, dude, I'm not an architect. He's like, yeah, I got an architect. I got three architects. I don't like anything they proposed. Oh, wow. So okay. I'm going to pick an architect. He's going to do the drawings. You know, but you're going to design, design it. it. Right. And um, so, again, that's just all about that. Like, it has, it, has it been built yet? Hasn't been built yet. Okay. It's been... Um, it's in like I got caught up in approvals. Okay. But what's cool is it's only it's like maybe five blocks from my house. Oh, whoa. So you know, that could be future the studio I, I would the the division is to work out some kind of a trade for 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 uh services and get a space in there. That'd be awesome to be to have designed your own studio. Yeah, that oh, wow. wild, right? Yeah. Uh and so I think I think what we do specialize in, and we're small, you know, less than five people. I mean, we've been as big as seven as needed, but okay. um, I think what we do specialize in is a type of project, right? Like we're not really good at like, hey, this is a bell jar, give us another bell jar. I, I've had companies come to me with that project, and I always just tell them like, I can't take that project in good conscience because I won't be better, faster, cheaper than your in-house team. They're experts in bell jars. Hmm. Now, if you want to redesign and rethink your whole category, like let's turn this whole thing upside down and really be like reinvent this. Okay. Um, or if you want to get into a new market that you're not in or you feel like you're backed into a corner and you need someone to take a totally fresh look at it, that's where we could help. Okay, right? That's where we add value. It's like let's give you a totally fresh take on this. And uh, I don't like the, the disruption word, but you know, let's make a halo product that people are going to really take notice of. And the brief of, for this building was super simple. It couldn't change the foundation footprint. And the brief was, I want a building that other people in the neighborhood will give directions by. Oh, okay. So, so this like, is definitely like, like, an out there building. It's, um, Distinct. It's distinct. It's distinct. Yeah. I can't, you know, okay. it's got to be. It, it fits with the. It's a. It's a. You know, it's a block around the ocean. It's a seaside town, so it has to have like the right feel. Right. But it's definitely going to be that building where people are like, "Yeah, I'm two blocks south of that building." Um, oh man! And I'm so excited that, to see this thing. Yeah, that's, that's cool. the. That's the. Pro, you know, that's that's where we win. Where it's like, if that's what you want to do, you're gonna like working with me. And we're gonna have fun. Uh, that's the sandbox that we play in. If you're like, hey, we make faucets and those faucets look like they're from the 1800s and we want you to make another faucet that looks right. like it's from the 1800s, right. I'm just going to be like, I'm going to suck at that. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to cost too much. Right. So you're doing. looking for projects that you can really have a hand in kind of redefining their their company in a way. That's my goal. That's your goal. You know, okay. and, and not, not every project will do that, um, but they have to be relevant and kind of authentic and, and aligned with my brand. So so a good example of maybe a project that's not like an industry leading project that we did, but that was released at the last Comic Con was uh, one of the Transformers, one of the new Transformers sideswipe for um, their new line, War for Cybertron Siege. And it was just like. You designed a Transformer? Yeah. I mean, a a toy? Or yeah. A full a toy. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, old college buddy of mine is the head of design over like a bunch of brands like uh, Transformers, G.I. Joe, a bunch of them. And he's like, dude, I saw on your Instagram, you're out on your own. You want to do some Transformers for us? I'm like, yeah, that sounds cool, you know? And they've got this like really cool brief. So like, okay, like go back to like the G1 80s Transformer. First one was Sideswipe, which was a Transformer I had okay. when I was a kid. And was this the motorcycle one? No, he was he was looked like a, a red Italian sports car. Okay. I don't think I'm supposed to say the brand. Okay, <laughs> um, and uh, they're like, go back to that, and then give us like the Cybertronian version of that. Oh. So I designed the car, right? And then they give what I designed to this Japanese guy, and then he makes it a robot. So that's crazy. And it's not like a, it's not like a hey, 
we've redefined this whole market, but it's just like, that's a cool project. I want to do that project. That's you know like what I mean? A, yeah, that's a really awesome mashup, too, to be like designing this really. And, it, and you have worked on some vehicles before. You yes. designed Icon, mm-hmm. uh, their, some of their cars. Yeah. Um, and then I, I, at Frog, I did some work for, um, for Honda and for Coros. And then now that I've been on my own, also done some work for a Saic, which is another Chinese car company. Hmm. Okay. How do you get connected with these companies? Uh, uh really? Yeah. Or any client really? Is it mostly yeah, word of mouth or? Uh, like almost a hundred percent. Okay. Uh, and, and I think that there are positives and negatives of of going out on your own early, you know, like we talked about, the overhead. Right. Right. Uh, is, is a great positive of going out on your head, out on your own early. I think the positives of going out on my own now, 20 years into my career, that I just kind of know everybody. Uh, and most of the people I know are old like me, who are in our 40s, and they are all like heads of design with budgets, oh, right? right? Yes, yeah, so you're or, connected now. And so it's a lot of like um, a, a, a lot of. I mean, one of my my number five biggest client this year was, I didn't know him, but he was getting VC funding and the VC firm he approached was one of the execs at the VC firm was the VP of finance at another company I worked at. And when he pitched, they're like, you got a great idea, like just total market for this, blah, blah, this, that, that, your design is terrible and here's the guy to do it. So he calls me up. He's like, I, they told me, the money people told me you would make my thing better. Great. <laughs> the zero, money people told me. Yeah, yeah, zero competitive bid. I love it. Um, when the money people talk, that's good. Right. And so I, I get a lot of that. I mean, okay. I did a pretty big project for um, a, a sports brand, uh, a design language system that goes across their whole 400 product line. Uh, and that just wrapped up a okay, few so weeks ago. And can, We can't talk about it yet? No, okay. no, no. But the CEO was um, a business unit um, general manager at Converse, right? Okay. And so, you know, he comes in three months in. He's like, I need more out of my design team. I need to show the PE owners I'm making progress. Who am I going to call? I'm going to call somebody I trust. I'm going to call somebody that after I stopped working with him at Converse, went to go work for a huge firm and now, and then ran design for a company. Like, yeah. like I just, I kind of like, I think tick a lot of boxes. Okay. So I, I don't actively seek a lot of work. I do say no to a lot of things. Right. Or I, and I like to say no in a unique way. I, I say no by saying yes to something else. I'm like, I don't want to do this project for you. You know, if Bell came to me, it's like, I want to do another Bell jar. I'd be like, I don't want to do that project, but here's the project I do want to do. And here's why I think you should do that project. It will help you. You know, you make great jars, but they haven't changed in 50 years. So let's really like reposition you for like, hey, how are like millennials preserving food? And like, how are we going to approach that? How are we going to make a statement? How are we going to get them to notice you again? That's And then usually they don't say yes to that, but sometimes they do. So sometimes they come back a few months later. Uh, I ended up doing a whole line of luggage for a company that way, like a 40-year-old luggage brand. Great, super high quality stuff, but just kind of stodgy. And... They're like, we want you to design a bag. And I was like, I don't want to design a bag. I can't, I'm not going to design another bag in your language. Right. Uh, but what I want to do is develop a whole line of bags that redefines your brand for the way millennials are traveling now mm. because travel is up, right. right? International travel is up. So what does it mean for that person? And he came back two months later, like, let's do that project you talked about. I love that. Yeah. I love that that way of saying no instead of just saying no let's think about it in the future but like saying no not to this one little thing but yes if you really want to define redefine the company i never tell them that their project is dumb either i just tell them that i'm not a good fit i'm just like this is not a good fit for me yeah, yeah, yeah. i can't and and that's really coming from my conscience of like yeah i could just take your money and do it but i don't think you'll enjoy working with me on that project and as a as you're a consultant is not the same as a freelancer, right. right? A consultant helps you with your business and it's advisory and it's strategic. Mm-hmm. And I I can't be a good consultant and take that project. Right. Where I feel like sometimes, specifically with some of my work, it's like, oh, I kind of have to take this because first of all, I'm starting out and like maybe I need the paycheck and yeah, you know, you, you, just, you gotta you gotta work your way up to that. No, but that's that's a cool tactic. 
Um, yeah, Michael, I also maybe want to like dive into maybe some more introspective questions. Like, sure. do you, when you look back on your career, were there any things that you would have done, done differently or maybe like pivotal moments that sure. went a different way than you expected? Or I think I was like, as you maybe could have gotten a sense from my story of college, I was not the most tactful person a, yeah. a lot of times. Like I, I think I like to think I always had the best of intentions, but sometimes it came out just terribly wrong okay. um, and overly blunt or caustic. And it took me a long time to, to learn that. Um, my, my wife refers to my operating system numbers like she'll like, I'll tell a story of like a time that I was an asshole, and she's like, "Oh yeah, that was Mike 1.0." Oh. Now I'm on like version 6.0 now. Okay, so you've, <laughs> you've toned it back some. Well, and I just learned that like, what's my goal here? What am I trying to do? Right. right? I'm not. I don't want anybody, buddy, to feel bad. Right. I but I do want to express my point of view, mm -hmm. but I want to express it in a way that's going to be heard. So, um, do you, you think know. that's bad though? Like I think sometimes we often design a side on the the like oh i don't want to hurt anybody's feelings side like, i don't know i think people hurt my feelings all the time but <laughs> <laughs> you look at some of the comments on my instagram sometimes like you suck i'm like all right cool thanks bro uh anyway hmm. uh but it depends I, I i think there's always a way um you know to be you can be critical without being crude yeah you, know? you can that's be critical true. without making it it's got to be about the work right and so i think i've just learned that like and I think that's a, a when you're younger, or if it was me, because I was, maybe I was just an idiot. But you're like, this sucks, and you suck because you made it. And now you're like, hey, I think you could do better than this. It's totally different, right? It's the same criticism, same point, but it's the same point. But but it's like you're pointing out that this isn't very good. But I'm also saying I think you have it in you to do more, right? And that's a that's a a positive criticism. Yeah, um, super encouraging that way. So I I. I I wish I had been, there are certain situations where, you know, I wish I could go back and, and do it better. I don't regret the decisions. Like, do I ever think, like, oh, I wonder what would happen. Like, if I never left Nike, it would have had a lot of stock. <laughs> you know, but, 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 you know, I wasn't ready to stay. You yeah. know? And, and I knew I had to kind of, I, I, in some ways, I wish I didn't have to do this, but I knew I had to go on this journey. Um, so... Yeah. I don't regret any of that, but right, I, just, right, right. I do wish that I maybe had like the tact and empathy that I at least try to have now. I don't always still kind of mess up, but, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I humans. Think everyone messes up for sure. Yeah, yeah. obviously. Um, no, that's a good answer. I, I also want to talk a little bit about your Instagram. I mean, you're an avid poster and sketcher yeah. on the, the gram. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a fun thing for you. And, well, yeah. And, and, uh, you also made a book. Right? Yeah. You know, you brought up earlier that not, or in the first episode, <laughs> you brought up in the first episode that not a lot of people have heard about design. And so I always saw social media as a way to raise awareness about design. And I don't even go like social media, you know, 0 0.1 to the Core 77 <laughs> forums, right? So right. And, and Core 77 went live in like 1995. I think, and yeah. I saw it in 1996. I remember one of my classmates showed it to me, and it was just one page, it was like one web page, you know, with stuff on it. It was, a, you know, like this kind of planetary graphic, and it wasn't very much. But I was like, wow, the web is like the shit. Like this is it. Magazines are done. Like that's you the know, future. Right? Writing to ID Magazine is not the way to get noticed anymore. Of course, it doesn't even exist anymore. You have to look it up. But um, so, so. Uh, and then when they launched the discussion forums, I don't know, I don't, I mean, I don't remember when they launched the forums. I remember I was working at Evo and it, like, it was a five person firm, right? So I was like, man, I need to know other designers. I need to understand what the hell's going on out there. Right. So I started posting on the discussion forums a lot and it was the wild west then. Like you didn't, you didn't need to have a login. It was, it was like, just free range. Mean, okay. yeah, the mean shit, but, but also interesting stuff. Um, and then in 2003, I think when I went to Nike, they had enforced a login and, uh, you know, for those of you that go on there, my, 
my login is it, my like whatever my screen name is yo and it was just like literally like i was typing my response and the first whatever for whatever reason the first word in my response was yo and then i went to post it and it was like you now need to make a login and i was like oh let's make a yo i guess and i'll change it later um and uh that no i know you can't change it oh you can't well now i can because i'm an admin but okay. only the admin can change it okay <laughs> so so just kind of stuck that's funny uh, but i've been i've talked to a lot of people who wanted to know like the deep origin stories of it and i'm like it's not so anyway, started uh, doing that, being the moderator for the forums, and then um, Stu uh, and Alan and Eric asked me if I wanted to write blog posts sometimes. I was like, yeah. Um, and then once you know Twitter and Instagram and all these things hit, I was just like, oh, this is just like the next, even more democratic version of this. Um, and I could show people what I'm doing right now. And I don't have crazy followers. Like, I mean, I have like, I think I have like 36,000, which is the good, but it's not like, I know designers are like way more. Right, uh, right, right. But, but I think I'm hot. I'm happy for them. It's like, because they're, they're raising the water level, right? The more people know about what we do, the better. Yeah. Because I think we'll find, one, we'll find undiscovered talent. There are plenty of people that maybe didn't know about design who could have, could have been and maybe will be great designers. Right. And, and also we're, we're educating people, we're educating consumers to think, oh, wow, like there's a whole world behind this thing that I just like found in a blister pack and I just thought was magically here. And we're educating maybe future clients. Yeah. And you've been posting every day? Do you post every day? Not every day. Okay. Uh, I did for 2017, I did a sketch, concept sketch every day. Um, and that's a lot usually, of work. Usually not work related because I couldn't show that stuff. Yeah. Um, so to be like after a whole day of doing concepts for a client or traveling or, oh man, like doing it at CES was the hardest. Uh, and then like then do another sketch for an hour um, for myself. And it didn't start out as a book. It started out as just like, you know, hey, I'm starting my own company. And I, I guess I like, I need to have, I'm a kind of a structured person. I have like a commute to work, even though, it's just like the studios in my home right, right now. So, right. Um, Wait, so what's your commute to work? Uh, I just go for like a two-mile walk with the dog. Oh, okay. And then when I come back, I'm at work. That's perfect. Yeah, it's good. I like that. I learned that from another designer, James Owen, who's an independent designer, who I, I, he told me in Portland, he used to like bike to a coffee shop like three miles away. Hmm. And then when he biked back, he was at work. That's funny. Uh, and then I commute home. So I walk the dog at night. And now, nice. now, now I'm not at work. That's and perfect. We, we re, remodeled, fully remodeled our house over the five years with knowing that I'd start my own business. So there's quite a large dedicated space to the business. Okay. Um, though it is like, I, I think we're probably reaching the end of like, you know, Christina comes home, my wife comes home from work and she's like, oh, there's interns there and like contractors. Mm. And so she's probably really like, we're probably like going to lose our lease on that, you know, <laughs> like and, and get a space. But it's been great because I just like to be surrounded by the work all the time. Uh, and so, but we got off track. So I, I started doing that sketch a day to have uh, structure. And about halfway through, I was like, I think this is a book. You know, like, I just think this is, I want this book. I want the, like, the, remember we talked about the Sears catalog? Right. I was like, I want the, like, physical Instagram, you know? <laughs> And um, so then I finished it, obviously. I mean, by the, it was like a bell curve. It was really hard to get started. And then as I got like to halfway through the year, it became really easy to do the sketch really? a day. I, I've actually never heard anyone say that. Oh, yeah. Then I was like, I got like the, the head of steam. I'm just like oh, cranking them out. And I'm like, I like thinking five sketches in the future. I, was ha I started to have lists of like, okay. tomorrow I'll do this one, then do this one. Then. Okay. And then... By the end of the year, I was like, oh, my God, can this be over? Oh, I, okay. Okay. I was like, counting down, like, 20 more to go, 19 more to go, 18 more to go. Um, it got really hard, but I tried to keep the quality up. That's funny. No, I mean, your sketches are amazing. I have I did a post a day, uh, I guess, same year as you, 2017, mm -hmm. where I just posted every day. But my, I didn't have a bell curve. It was just like straight hard for the entire time. <laughs> oh, year. man. It's, yeah, then you, it's like not only doing the drawing, but then I think about have something somewhat intelligent to say about it, right? Because yeah. it, it, the drawing is a representation of an idea. Right. So like, here's the idea. 
And so anyway, and then turns out making a book isn't easy. So <laughs> I was like, I have to like lay out a book and write something about every sketch. And then once a month, the first day of the month, I tr- write like a bigger paragraph about what I was thinking. Um, and then like have a, like a prologue of like why I did this project and then sourcing a publisher and like trying to figure out how I get to be on Amazon. And it's like, oh my God, getting an ISBN that, number. That's a whole project in itself, yeah. right? So so I was like, oh, I'll, I'll have the book done by the end of Q1, but it just launched a few weeks ago. So, okay. <laughs> and it was just a really busy year at clients. So thankfully that's like awesome. So it just, it got pushed to the bottom of the list for a while. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, busy's good. But yeah, I mean, Obviously, if you're listening to this, definitely check out Michael's book. We'll link to it on the website. Um, and, of course, you can just check out Michael's Instagram for the link, I'm sure, as well. Yeah, it's somewhere just, on there. just in time for the holidays. Great okay. present. <laughs> and you, it's on Amazon, so you can just search it on Amazon, yes. too. Yeah, just search my name on Amazon. Pops right up. Um, yeah, and, you know, support Michael. He's doing awesome stuff. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. Honestly, got- like, if no books sell, I'm okay. Like uh, books you, are you selling. Wanted one. You want one, right? I mean, but books are selling. So I mean, because I, I check every day. I'm right. a nerd. But uh, so books are selling. But I, um, I honestly feel like if none sold, I would be like, I did it. Yeah, right. it was about completion. Yeah, you know, and it's completed, and that was the success. And now the fact that some books are selling, and I can get the updates in real time, it's like, oh, cool. That's Ooh. fun. Yeah. Um. All right. I have a another question. Sure, please. When you look back at. I mean, you're you're you know you're very uh, involved in the community still, mm-hmm. um, especially these young designers coming up are looking to you as uh, you know inspiration. Do you see anything in the younger generations, and even like me, like you know, in, in mm-hmm. the people that are five, ten years out of school, are, are we? What do you see that we could be doing better, or like, do you see that we're lacking some skill sets, or mm-hmm. I don't know. What do you, what do you I see hate- with that? I, I really don't like um, millennial bashing. Okay. You know, like, well, we don't have to call it millennials. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. But, you know, I think, like, it's a, it's a thing uh, that, you know, a lot of people do. And, I mean, sometimes I could be guilty of it, but the kids these days syndrome. <laughs> um, but I, I think, like, I've worked, I've been, I've been a director since I was 30. So I've been managing people for 12, going on 13 years, uh, 12 years. Um and I've managed a lot of millennials, and I've managed some good ones and some bad ones, and I've managed a lot of Gen Xers, and I've managed some good ones and some bad ones, and I've managed a lot of boomers, too, and I've managed some good ones and some bad ones. Oh, okay. um, now, there are trends, right? I think one of the hardest things that you younger designers have coming up is, like, there's just a lot more to learn. Uh, you know, when, when I was coming up, it's like, one, you didn't know what the hell's going on in any other school. If you wanted to find out what was going on, if I was at RISD, I wanted to find out what was going on at Pratt, I'd have to hop on a train, come down to Pratt. Right. Just, so that was a blessing and a curse, right? You're like in your own little bubble uh, doing your thing. And it was like, you know, day one of the design school, setting up a parallel rule, you know, like like mechanical drafting and making models by hand. And, and now you guys are doing all that. You're doing sketching and you're doing CAD. And you're learning about rapid prototyping and, you know, and, and you're learning about UX, UI. And I, I think, so I think that's a, a challenge. Um, I think one thing that I think would be great for some frame, a framework for, for younger designers is understanding that you're not going to be doing everything you want to do in year one. So like when I talk to like students or young graduates are like i really wanted to do design strategy i'm like what the fuck do you know about it? you don't know shit you don't know right, enough right. to do that yeah yeah <laughs> like i talked to a young student she's like i want to do organizational design you never even worked anywhere <laughs> you know like go work somewhere for 20 years and then we come up with some good ideas for organizational right. design right but uh and and so i think it's just like just I, mean, I talked about it the course 77 things like just take it like one block at a time and build that tower right so for me, I obviously always loved sketching, and I really focused on that Evo, and I became kind of like almost like the cleanup guy uh, in a weird way. Like other people might be working on a project, and if it wasn't going so well, one of the partners might come in and be like, hmm, yeah, okay, Michael's going to come in and just like probably just redo all this stuff. <laughs> and like I realized that was really cool, but also like not a really good friend maker. Okay. Um, but also one of the other cool things about working there at the time was like there was no model maker 
we had CAD specialists. We had two like pro e jockeys, right? So uh, one of them sat next to me. So I might be sketching on one project and he was building CAD for another project of my design. And I could be looking over and be like, okay. And, and that was a really good way to learn how to delegate and how to manage. Huh, okay. But also kind of the unspoken rule is that the junior designers often made the senior designers models. So, you know, I would get a senior designer sketch and they'd be like, go, you know, go build this model punk. And, uh -oh. and so you know, build it and they're like, what? That line doesn't mean that. That means yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. And my sketching got so much better after building other people's models for two years. That's interesting, huh? Because I was like, oh, that's what that line means. Or like, you know, you just like, there's certain things where you're like, okay, it looks really cool on the page, but that never looks good in real life. Right. right. And I mean, it's just like certain things like, oh, that looks really good on the screen in CAD, but then you make a 3D print and you're like, what? That's terrible. So, um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, don't be afraid to just kind of like build those skills in your first years. Basically, school has only earned you enough skill to get a job. I mean, I thought I was like the shit coming out of school. I like I had that faculty award and like... <laughs> When's people going to start calling me, right? <laughs> right? And then I got my first job, and I'm like, I'm the worst dude here. Like, everybody's way better than me. Yeah. Uh, which was awesome. And I used to go around at night and take all the other designer sketches who I thought were better than mine, and I would photocopy them, and I would bring them home, and I would try to redraw that better. Oh, wow. That's cool. So I forgot about that. But <laughs> And so, you know, like, don't, that's the first two, three years, that's what's going to be. And go somewhere where they're going to, like, kick your ass every day you'll get better and like we, we did a lot of toys at evo and for whatever reason it's like i couldn't draw a toy to save my life it's just like a totally different thing you got to think about you got to think about what a kid is going to love to play with right play pattern you got to think about what a mom or a dad is going to want to buy right which is different because kids don't have money right right the consumer yeah. is not the purchaser yeah the user is not the purchaser uh, and then you have to think about making it as cheap as possible because the toy company wants to make as much, much margin as possible. Right, of course. So you think of like yeah. these three things that are really in conflict with one another. Um, and there was one guy in the office, Scott Johnstone, who's just like bust out amazing toys all day long. And I was like, I will, and I actually didn't, didn't, what didn't and totally enjoy designing toys at the time, but I'm just a competitive person. So I was like, I will not rest until my shit starts to get picked over his stuff. And the day that started happening, I was like, yeah. You know, like, anyway, just dig in, yeah. you know, don't, some people think like, oh, I got that first job, it's time to coast, I made it. Like, right. No, you just earned the right to begin to earn it. Right. You just <laughs> got in there. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's great advice, Michael. Um, do you have any other like closing remarks? Any other thoughts you have floating around? Um, I, I just like, I will, I do have one thing. One, don't be afraid to go find mentors right like Wait, people where do you find your mentors by the way i meant to ask you that because um, you said like you've yeah. always had mentors throughout your career yeah. do you just find them in your companies that you've worked at yeah or? just you know you could just tell when somebody wants to help okay right and and so you foster that like when if someone is being helpful to you you know be like hey can i buy you coffee to thank you for helping me and then they're gonna help you more and yeah and that can become a lifelong thing like just because you leave a job doesn't mean you can't reach back out to that old boss and get his advice. Yeah. Um, and so mentor people or pick up mentors, collect okay. them. You know, I have different mentors for different things. Uh -huh. I have mentors for my business. I have mentors for design, right. mentors for life. Right. Um, and then be one. You know, you know, you can never repay those mentors back, but you can mentor other you people. Pass it on. Yeah. That's and because and, it also just feels really good. Yeah. You know, uh, feels good to help people. So. I guess that would just be my parting thing. And I, I think that's why I like to mentor people. That's why I post on the forums and on Instagram and people email me all the time. Uh, I mean, and you're doing this podcast, doing this podcast, Share, sharing yeah. the knowledge. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome. Well, it's, yeah. it's all the pleasures all over here, Michael. Yeah. It was a wonderful uh, time talking with you and hopefully we can get you back when James is here and then, you know, yeah. he'll, he'll, He'll turn the whole thing upside down. He'll have a lot more questions for you. All right, cool. But um, round three. Yeah, round three. Um, yeah, I, I wish you luck with your new studio. And yeah, we'll, we'll keep in touch with you. And uh, I really appreciate it again. Thank you. Um, of course, at, as always, I'm at Nick P. Baker. And you can find Michael DiTullo at? At DiTullo. D-2-L-O. Nice. All right. See you guys later. Peace.